KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. The candidates for San Diego mayor made a final pitch to voters today. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr has the story. And if given the honor of being San Diego's next mayor, I commit to you, I will work every day. Si se puede. 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 Gracias a todos. With mere hours to go until voting begins, the candidates for San Diego mayor made their closing arguments today. Both Congressman Bob Filner and City Councilman Carl DeMaio have been campaigning for at least a year. And recent polls show it's going to be a close one. The latest Survey USA poll released today by 10 News shows Filner with a slight lead over DeMaio, though DeMaio has made up ground over the last two weeks. Seven percent of likely voters remain undecided. DeMaio made his final appeal during a news conference on Harbor Island. He was backed by fellow Republicans, including current Mayor Jerry Sanders and the Republican members of the San Diego City Council. They echoed DeMaio's assertion that only he can move the city forward through continued financial reforms. This election is about whether we will have the courage, the commitment, and the collaborative approach to continue to implement reform, to fix our financial problems, to put the savings back into our services like after school programs, and work together to revitalize our economy. Across town at the Logan Heights Library, Filner tried to persuade Latino voters to go to the polls and support him. Filner says his administration would focus on neighborhoods and change who controls the city. We've been given a lot of money to a few people. The recent decisions at City Hall show that we're giving away public money to private people who give campaign contributions, who own newspapers, who control this city's politics. They think they're going to buy City Hall. They think they're going to buy the City Council. We say that day is over. The polls are open tomorrow from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. California's political watchdog agency claims it's the largest case of campaign money laundering in state history. The $11 million contribution comes from an Arizona nonprofit. It gave money to a group trying to defeat Governor Jerry Brown's tax initiative, Prop 30. The names of the donors aren't known because nonprofit groups are involved. The state attorney general says she will investigate to see if any rules were broken. The governor came to San Diego this morning to pitch his tax measure. It would raise the sales tax and income taxes for the wealthy. The revenue would go towards education. We have a simple choice. Do we cut our schools six billion more or do we ask those who have enjoyed the highest incomes, the greatest blessings to give back a little to California in our time of need? Support for Prop 30 has slipped recently. The latest field poll shows it's below 50 percent. Opponents of the measure say there's no guarantee schools will get the money, and they say small businesses would suffer. Polls open in less than 24 hours, and candidates in high-profile races have been spending big in hopes to receive your vote tomorrow. Those candidates had to disclose Friday just how much they've been spending and raising in the past few days. Ryan Grohowski from our investigations desk joins us from the News Center. Ryan, what's new in the finance race? Well, this is a critical time for candidates. So they're ramping up spending in order to make sure their name is front and center in your mind when you enter the voting booth. But it's actually not the candidates who are really shelling out the big bucks. It's the super PACs, the independent committees working to elect certain candidates. These PACs have been throwing tons of money into the mayoral race. And what do the numbers look like? These committees are focusing their efforts on advertising, PACs working to elect either Congressman Bob Filner or Councilman Carl DeMaio have spent more than $400,000 in TV airtime just in this past week. They've also spent a lot on web and print advertising, and I've got some of them right here. I'm sure everybody's getting them in their mailboxes. Since these committees have virtually no spending or fundraising limits, they're making large expenditures so the candidates themselves don't have to. Yeah, we saw the three bags full of uh, ads that you uh, brought in today. Yep. How did the candidates do this period in terms of spending? 
A DeMaio kept his fundraising lead. He brought in more than $300,000 this period, which spanned 12 days and ended Thursday. He's raised about $3.6 million in cash overall. And meanwhile, Filner has raised only about $80,000 this period, and he has yet to hit the million-dollar mark in cash raised. So, Ryan, the big question, is this it for fundraising? Uh, I wish, but no, candidates can raise money up to and after the election. Uh, just about every candidate has accrued debt that they'll need to pay off after the election. And if any candidate or super PAC gets a big donation before tomorrow, they're required to file reports daily, so we're keeping an eye on it. All right, Ryan Grohowski of our investigations desk. For more on how the candidates' coffers stack up, go to kpbs.org slash election. Most of us are familiar with election polls, but how accurate are they? Peggy Pico talks with a polling expert about interpreting the numbers. We'll be tracking the exit polls tomorrow as an early predictor of the election. Joining me to explain how polls are done and about their reliability is Richard Hofstadter, professor of political science at San Diego State University. Thank you so much for joining us. Richard, how are polls conducted in a way that they're trying to be fair? Well, the, the um, traditionally, um, traditional polls done by major companies who do them correctly uh, involve statistical sampling, involve interviewing, and design factors, and also analysis. And those need to come together. They try to be as objective as they can because they're usually commercial exercises. And the poll results are advertising for them as well as uh, public good. Advertising for their accuracy. For their company, yes. Um, but the suspicion is, of course, that uh, parties, political parties, actually kind of weigh these polls in their favor. Is that true? The parties do, yes. Uh, they interpret the polls and, you know, campaigns are contests and each side is trying to win in each campaign and so they release information which may be true, but it's released selectively, typically. So in the way they're conducted, they're uh, conducted fairly, but perhaps in the way they're interpreted. Is that That's what you're right. saying? Okay. Yeah, and the reason for the objectivity of them is simply because uh, these are companies and their commercial fate depends on how uh, accurate the poll is. All right. Let's look at three separate recent polls for San Diego's mayor race. The first is from San Diego uh, Metro Magazine, and it finds mayoral candidates DeMaio and Filner nearly tied with 18 percent undecided. But a UT San Diego poll found DeMaio was ahead by 10 percent, while a poll survey USA for Channel 10 News gave Filner a 7 percent lead with an undecided vote of 13 percent, not 18 percent. How could there be three different, uh, you know, separate polls all around the same time with such different results? Well, we'd have to ask a number of questions. We'd have to ask what their samples were, when the polls were done. Uh, we'd have to see the questions to evaluate them in terms of whether or not they're loaded in one direction or another, and a number of other factors of that kind. And that's typically not released in the press. Is that a discrepancy that those 10 percent or 7 percent even, that, that those discrepancies seem more than the plus or minus 3 percent that you expect? Uh, they are. And they're probably due to the design of the survey itself. How many people refuse? Typically in a, in a uh, large scale survey, say in the state of California, uh, about 20 percent participate of those contacted. Well, the question is, what 20 percent are those? Maybe the and, activists, maybe the people who are more active, you know, well, more active. precisely, yeah, more interested. Okay. And are they weighed, weighted? to the population in some sense. Okay. So, Let's talk about cell phones, though. I understand that a lot of these surveys, uh, they're called on their cell phones, and people, a lot of people have their cell phones as a primary phone, uh, as their mm -hmm. primary phone number. How would that impact a poll? Well, in the United States, about 34% are now cell phone only. That's a large proportion. And these people tend to be younger. They te uh, Many immigrants to the United States have cell phones. Uh, they tend to be more educated. And those people are different than others. And so their built-in population biases 
I see. to that to a certain extent. Now, a good survey firm will try to correct that statistically by waiting and other procedures. So for the average voter, would it be better to look at a whole bunch of different polls and sort of do an average or a trend? It would certainly be better to compare different polls. Could you get a, a good reading, though, say they're about neck and neck or that they're about 5 percent off? No. You really couldn't. No, there's statistical error. And that statistical error in any survey, if the survey is right on the money, that's luck. If the, we anticipate the survey to be off three or four percent, and if we're talking about electoral contests where, you know, it's one or two percent separating the candidates, there's no way to uh, predict accurately. Let's talk about exit polls. How are they done and are they accurate? Um, I should say any more accurate than the polls before well, the election. Well, they're accurate for what they are. Okay. Whether you want to project that to a larger population is a different question, different issue. Um, exit polls are typically done by selecting certain precincts within election districts which have a history of, of uh, a certain uh, a partisan vote being given to one side or the other at a certain level. And what the exit poll analyses typically do is look at the discrepancies and the patterning of discrepancies in partisan contests across the various exits. So they know going in that there is a discrepancy at a polling site and that's why they choose that polling site? Well, no, that what they're looking at, yeah, they do know that it's more Republican or more Democrat mm -hmm. or evenly split. But what they're really looking at is there a general trending toward the Republicans or the Democrats across the polls and if there are what particular groups are associated with them. All right. So what about the prediction? I've heard that you can predict the presidential uh, outcome pretty accurately from exit polls. Is that true? Well, the votes are cast by the time you get the exit polls. Mm -hmm. um, it depends again. Most presidential elections are pretty close. This one, you know, appears to be by all intents and purposes very close. And uh, there is statistical error in exit polls as well. All righty. We are unfortunately out of time. Mm. Political science professor Hofstadter, -Le, thank you so much for talking with us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. The KPBS Voter Guide can help you at the polls. The big races and measures are broken down into clear language. You can even take it to the polls on your smartphone. It's online at kpbs.org slash voter guide. Now, tomorrow evening, our election coverage begins at 5 with a PBS NewsHour special. We'll bring you local returns when they start coming in just after 8 o'clock. And then at 9, join us for a one-hour KPBS election special. Our team will bring you the latest numbers, reports from the field, and analysis of the vote. It all starts tomorrow evening at 5. San Diego prepares for tomorrow's election with beefed-up resources. Peggy Pico explains what to expect at the polls. Even with mail-in ballots and early voting, preparation for tomorrow's election is in overdrive. Joining me to talk about what to expect is San Diego County Registrar Deborah Seiler. Deborah, thanks for taking some time out and talking with us today. You're welcome. No, you're busy. Now, you brought in a lot of extra staff. Um, what are they doing tomorrow? Well, tomorrow, our office is like a regular polling place. We'll be open from 7 in the morning until 8 at night. People will be coming into our office to vote. And, of course, we will be fielding calls from all over the county regarding the voting experience throughout the 1,527 precincts that we have. Um, I came in and voted over the weekend at the registrar. Um, has early voter turnout, there were lines out the door when I went there, and they moved pretty fast. Has it been, uh, do you think, earlier voters, more of them this year? Yes, there have been more early voters this year than, than certainly in the June primary and certainly in, in the 2010 elections. We are, um, uh, we have lots of people coming in on Saturday. When you came in, we served 1,900 voters that day. Yeah, it moved pretty fast. Tell us the rule for mail-in ballots. Is it too late to mail in your ballot today? I would say yes, it is too, too late to mail in the ballot. And our office, our our, our facility is open from, uh, well, it's open at 7 this morning and it'll be open till 6 tonight. People just can drive into the facility there. They don't even have to get out of the car. They can just drive down to the drop off box and drop those mail ballots. Now, tomorrow, any voter in the county of San Diego can drop off their mail ballot at any polling place 
That's a county of San Diego polling place. Right. Tonight, uh, it's too late for our audience after 6, but tomorrow, it's important to drop that in because they need to be uh, actually in your hands by tomorrow at close of election. That is correct. Yes, they need to be They need to be received by our office by close of polls, which is 8 p.m. Let's talk about the rules at the polling place. What can voters uh, not do? Let's start with that as far as badges, hats, uh, signs. What can they and can't they do? Well, there's no electioneering. We call it electioneering within 100 feet of the polling place. So that means that voters will not be allowed to come into the polling place with a yes on 32 or a no on 30 or whatever uh, proposition they might be supporting or candidates. So they can't have any hats, buttons, shirts, jackets with campaign-related uh, messages on them. Uh, what about uh, when will you finish counting the votes? Like, So the polls close tomorrow at, uh, what time do the polls close? Well, the polls close tomorrow at 8 o'clock. And just shortly after 8 o'clock, within a few minutes, we'll be releasing the results from all those mail ballots that came into our office early. And so that'll probably be maybe 25 30 percent of the entire vote that we'll release right then. But then we'll start counting the precinct ballots. Those returns start coming back around 930. And by 10, 30, 11 o'clock, we have lots and lots of precinct results. But we'll be counting those until we finish, until we've counted every last precinct. How about the mail-in ballots? Now, I know those get counted. The, the signatures have to be checked. So when will those be counted? Well, the, the, the voters who drop their mail ballots at the polling place tomorrow, and there will be many of them, those go into the count probably, uh, well, later this week and early next week, because you're exactly right. We do. We have to verify the signatures on all of those mail ballots before we can open them. All right. And let's talk briefly about poll uh, watchers. I understand there's actually several thousand out nationwide. There will be some here in San Diego. What do poll watchers do? Well, poll watchers do just that. They observe. They watch. Uh, it, it's part of making the poll process transparent. So people can sit there. They're now they're not supposed to uh, interfere with the voting process. They're not supposed to really speak to the voter. Uh, if, if they want to, they should be 25 feet outside the polling place. But they can see who's coming in. They can see that the process is being handled uh, appropriately. Um, and basically, they can just watch. They can't interfere or they certainly can't touch the ballots. But they, may, touch do, the they may do exit polls, though, just so people aren't uh, surprised by that. <clears throat> they could do, they could. They could ask voters about their voting experience or how they voted, but they must do that 25 feet from the entrance to the polling place. All right, Deborah Seiler, San Diego County Registrar of Voters, thanks so much for talking with us. You're welcome. Brown on the next news hour, the state of the race on the final day of campaigning, plus the last push over the weekend in Ohio. It's Monday on the PBS News Hour. A big moving project is underway in San Diego's North County. Southern California Edison is moving a huge steam generator from the San Onofre nuclear plant. It will take about three weeks to get the unit to a waste disposal site in Utah. This is not one of the street steam generators with leaky tubes. San Onofre has been shut down, of course, since late January because of tube troubles. A decision to cancel a British theology professor's appearance at the University of San Diego is causing an uproar from the U.S. to London. Peggy Pico tells us the invitation was pulled because of the professor's support of same-sex marriage. Over a year ago, British theologian Tina Beattie agreed to lecture at USD, but just days before she was to arrive from London, USD President Mary Lyons rescinded the invitation because of Beattie's support of civil marriage of same-sex couples in the UK. Lyons' letter stated the cancellation was in part, quote, to the contradiction between the mission of the center and your own public stances as a Catholic theologian with the intentions of those who have financially supported the center. Joining me now via Skype from London is Tina Beatty, professor of Catholic studies at the University of Roehampton. Uh, professor Beatty, thanks for joining us. What was the subject of your lecture at USD? It was going to be on representations of women and sin in Christian art. It was the Amelia Switkow lecture that I'd been invited to give. So it had nothing to do, really, with any of the subjects that were controversial 
around some of my position. You and 27 other prominent uh, Catholics sent a letter, uh, signed a letter supporting same-sex civil marriage in the UK. Uh, is that against Catholic doctrine or tradition? No, because the letter referred to same-sex civil marriage. It's not referring to the sacraments of the church or the doctrines of the church. It's to do with the position that Catholics have as citizens in a modern democracy, where we have to enter into public debate about laws. And of course, some Catholics disagree that same-sex marriage should be permitted under civil law, and some agree. And we were just trying to put forward the point that those who agree are not in bad faith with the church. All right, this has made headlines, of course, here in the U.S. and across Europe. Has the response been different between the countries? Well, I think by and large, we've, it's probably fair to say that there's been less conflict and tension in the church in this country. It's much less politicized. I get the feeling watching the uh, um, election campaign that Catholicism is very politicized in the States at the moment and quite divided. And we don't have that in this country, but it would be a great shame if that did start. Would... Uh, because some people tried to close down open spaces of public debate on issues of common concern to all citizens and people. Tina, what do you hope happens next? I hope this opens up space for a really creative debate and dialogue about the role of lay theologians like myself in relation to the magisterium and about the role of funding, private funding, in relation to academic freedom. If it does that, this will be, have, been, have been a very, very good thing to happen. And I would be happy that my own situation had been the catalyst for that. Those are the big issues, not whether my trip is cancelled or not. Although I'm very sorry not to be coming to your beautiful country <laughs> in uh, sunny November. <laughs> All right. Well, we are out of time. Theologian Tina Beattie, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. The University of San Diego provided us with this statement, which reads in part, it is my considered judgment that Dr. Beatty's decision to exercise her office as Catholic theologian and sign a public document dissenting from the church's official teaching is what led me to rescind this invitation. Joining me to discuss academic freedom is USD professor of philosophy, Larry Hinman. And just to be clear, he is not speaking on behalf of the university. Professor Hinman, thanks for joining us. What was the reaction among students and faculty uh, when this got out that this cancellation happened? Well, certainly the reaction among a m number of faculty were, were that they were outraged and they were also disappointed uh, because it seemed like such a needless mistake to make. And But there seemed to be widespread agreement that it was a mistake to rescind the invitation. Historically, how has USD balanced their uh, academic freedom, shall we say, mm -hmm. and the church doctrine? Well, it's a, a, a that's all always a delicate balancing act. We have tended to do pretty well, I think, on balancing it within the classroom uh, with outside speakers and visitors. I, I think we've done less well. So this is uh, simply another instance of things that have occurred in the past. President Lyons' letter did admit that financial support for the center was part of the reason uh, she had to cancel. What kind of influence do you think donor support should have on academia, if any? Well, I think uh, those are the types of things, and I know this is easy to say as a faculty member, but those are the types of things you want to negotiate up front. And I think part of what made this decision um, so bad was that it wasn't made in any collaborative way. And so it came as a total shock to the director of the center who had all the way along sought approval of each step. And that's not a, not a good thing. All right, unfortunately, we are out of time. On our website, people can find out about what you have to say about the Catholic University's right or even obligation to conform to Catholic, uh, Catholic doctrine. Professor Hinman, thanks so much for your insight. My pleasure. While the negative campaigning rises to a fever pitch one day before the election, you'll find nothing but friendly competition among dozens of small brewers seeking approval from San Diego beer fans. KPBS arts and culture reporter Beth Accomando checks in on Beer Week.
The San Diego Brewers Guild sponsors the annual San Diego Beer Week. The 10-day countywide event informs people about regional brewing heritage and showcases San Diego's nearly 60 breweries, says Guild President Sean DeWitt. San Diego has become known as the uh, craft beer capital and a craft beer destination. I don't know how much the average person knows that there are 60 breweries with another 30 in planning. I think it's becoming known. Brian Scott is vice president of the Guild. It's going to be the biggest beer we've ever had. It's the fourth annual. We've got so many more breweries than we've ever had before. And the scene and the community is really accepting of us, and it's, it's just great. San Diego is so renowned for its beers that uh, I live about six blocks away. And when I heard that something like 20 or 30 breweries breweries were going to be represented in one place at one time, I had to be here. Garen Carpenter was one of the thousands of beer enthusiasts from San Diego and around the country who came to sample some of the hundred plus beers. To promote and create the awareness of locally brewed craft beer in San Diego, that's actually our true mission statement for the San Diego Brewers Guild and uh, I think we're doing a darn good job. Laura Ulrich was working the breast cancer awareness booth Beer for Boobs at the Guild Fest on Saturday. It's been pretty amazing um, to go into a bar and notice that all the tap handles are now ballast point stones. Nice to see the change from, you know, the Miller and the Budweiser and the Coors and all those guys to more of the local craft scene. We've got about another hour and 10 minutes uh, prior to last call and I think uh, I'm going to taste most breweries in just one go around. Beth Agamondo reporting. Tonight's stories are on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Join us for full election coverage tomorrow night, starting with the PBS NewsHour special report at 5. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.